hello, hello. <clears throat> Sorry for the delay. Uh, we're streaming on, as as you can see, uh, Twitch Red or MLH Red, and that means an entirely different stream setup, which involves a whole bunch of differences. So we're going to give people, including myself, a lot of time today. Hello, hello. There are people here. Okay, I've been sending out the notifications that I can, trying to figure things out. Hello, hello. Welcome. The stream looks different and will be acting differently because we're streaming to MLH Red today. Let me see if I can pull up. Hey, okay, it is working. Hey, okay, it is working. That's, wait. Huh, you'll notice everything is mirrored from where it normally is with me. Hey, Skitty, hello, hello. From where it normally is with me. Hey, Skitty. Uh, yeah, I have way, way, way less control over everything that's happening here. UT is ending the stream. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I understand. It takes time. We're just vibing. <laughs> Trying to... I don't know. I feel like I'm going slightly insane because everything is just slightly different. I like know my own streaming setup inside and out. And with this, like, I just want to make sure that everything is working. Hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome, y'all. Okay. Theoretically, the mainstream just ended. Yep, it's over now. Um, okay. This is the weird thing about streaming on multiple different Twitch channels. Um, okay. So that should be working there. Hello, hello. Let me double check to see if we're live on YouTube. I think so. Okay. Hey, more people are trickling in. Welcome, welcome, y'all. Can you all hear the music? You should be able to, but... Hey, hey, Shem. <clears throat> oh, it's been a little chaotic getting to this point. Let me figure out how I'm going to do screen sharing. Great. Okay. I don't have any of my usual tips, tricks, or tools. Oh, it's totally fine that UT's stream went over. Streams go over all the time. 
I wanted to honestly start mine right at like 10 so that I would have time to work through all the kinks while he was finishing up. Because yeah, this is a little bit <laughs> slash very different from how my stream normally works. Great. Well, how are y'all doing this morning? Well, it's morning for me and Shem. You'll also notice that everything looks mirrored in this background to y'all. Um, <laughs> that is apparently a thing that I like mirror in OBS that I can't mirror here. So y'all are seeing, I don't know. It's weird to me, but it just is, it is what it is. Hey, I'm glad it's going amazing, Skitty. So today, for those of y'all who are interested, well, I was going to say for those of y'all who haven't read the stream title, but then I realized that like you, you needed to read that. Anyway, we're going to be talking about open source and creative commons licenses. Oh, Shem, feel free. Yeah, go ahead and share. Oh, that's so sad. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's always so hard to lose a pet. Sending you all the, the love and support I can. How are you doing? I know, probably sad and overwhelmed. Crying a lot, but as usual, Emily is here to save the day. Well, I'm glad. Take care of yourself as best you can. Drink water. Yeah. Hey, Hacker J. I'm doing well. I'm uh, filled with empathy for Shem because that's always hard. I've thought about that a lot with Banana, who has been on stream a couple of times. Well, I don't necessarily know how to transition out of this. But we're going to be talking about Creative Commons and open source licenses today. Um, specifically, the differences between them, which ones you can use for different types of projects, which one you might want to use for your projects, basically anything you would want to know. And we're going to basically break it down into a couple parts. We're going to first talk about, Shem, you do not need to apologize. Not at all. I was the one who was like, yeah, feel free to share. Like, I want this to be a space where people feel okay showing up no matter what's happening. So... You're good. Um, oh, so we're going to start with talking about... Uh, da, da, da. <clears throat> I'm going to give an overview on the difference between Creative Commons licenses and open source licenses. And then we're going to talk more specifically about open source licenses, then Creative Commons licenses. And then we're going to go over finding tools for you to use in your projects. Uh, I fully, I fully need to understand licenses. Yeah, it's, it can sometimes be overwhelming. I get that. Um, but I'm going to give you all some cheat sheets that you can use after this. And we're going to go over the broad strokes that you need to understand. And Hecker, I'm new to MLH and I'm scared a little bit. That is very, very valid. Um, because MLH can be like a big community and it can sometimes be overwhelming, but also with that big community comes a lot of care and a lot of support. And if you want to join the Discord, discord.mlh.io, you will see a lot of people who have been exactly in your position um, where, like, I know when I first started becoming involved in that, the hackathon community, uh, I was really overwhelmed, but I met people who had been to hackathons before and had been to streams and done all of the things and knowing those people was really helpful. So it can be overwhelming, but we're here, we're open and yeah, ask any questions. So we're going to start, I don't, uh, I feel so, so bare without all the other things on stream. Um, 
we're going to start by talking about the difference between open source and creative commons because the two things are used in a very similar way but they are different on some like deep fundamental levels starting with open source is what we all are, are here we know something about and hopefully at this point in the week you've you've learned some really interesting things, maybe how to contribute to projects, maybe how you've attended some of my streams, how to like find open source tools to use and, and that sort of thing. And to, to summarize, in essence, the way that I think about open source is that someone has made something, traditionally code in this instance, and they are giving that code to the world both to build on top of and to tinker with. They're like opening up the hood and letting you see that. And also they're letting you use it as a finished product. So there's both of those there. Creative Commons is a slightly different thing. It, you wouldn't license code under Creative Commons. You would license um, artwork, music, um, writing, those sort of things under Creative Commons because Creative Commons is a way of licensing your work to be reused by other people um, and edited and modified and that sort of thing. But there isn't the same sort of community that builds around open source where people are building on something together as a group. Creative Commons is usually one specific piece that is then released as opposed to something that people are building together. Photography is a great example, Shem. So that's, that's like the main difference between the two of them. And you'll usually, when building a project or working on a hackathon project, you'll be using both. So when you're writing the code, you'll be using creative or you'll be using open source licensed work. And then when you're like building out your, like, I know there is, let's see if I can find this. If I do this, hey, oh look, okay. There is this, which is humans, um, which is a, a Creative Commons illustration library. You'll notice that it's licensed under CC0, and we'll talk about what that means. And this is um, this art style, I believe, is called Corporate Memphis, and you can see that it is very common in a lot of tech spaces uh, on tech websites and presentations and things like that. So if you were to use something like this in your project. This is something that is Creative Commons, CC0. So your code might be open source, your artwork, your assets might be Creative Commons. Um, Shem, that is literally going to be a page that we are going to be looking at together. So we're starting with just giving an overview and then, da, da, da. okay, let's talk about why it is important to check those licenses. So yes, mind meld. If you are using work for a personal project or a school project, the, the total number of people who are seeing it is maybe like 20 at most. You can get away with using things that you aren't licensed to use. But if you are then submitting this to any large competitions, if you're doing like a hackathon that's by like Google or something like that, um, they will often check to see if what you're using is licensed and they will notice if what you're using isn't licensed. There's also a moral and ethical standard of um, like not just stealing people's work and using it as your own. And this is more common specifically with uh, images and artwork and things like that, especially in the computer science space where you will just Google like, oh, I need to make a cover photo for my dev post page. Um, um, my project is about like apple picking robots. I'm just going to search apple picking robot and take the first picture and use that. And that you don't know if you're able or you're allowed to use that image. Um, and there are actually places specifically with photography. And this was more a while ago where when blogging was really popular, people would be taking these images and using them as header images on their blog. Very nice. But then there were automated scraping tools by the rights holders of all of these photos that would then go through and DMCA all of these different websites or ask for licensing fees of like, hey, I see that you used my photo in order to license it for use on your website. You now owe me a hundred bucks. And you don't want that to happen on like a personal level and also on a moral level. Like it helps to use things that you know that you can use. And it also, I personally think it always feels good to use work that the artist is like, I want other people to use this. I want this to go out in the world. So that's why it's important to check your licenses. Um, when you're talking about open source licenses, it can be really important because if you are trying to make a startup, you might accidentally be using code um, that is free for personal use 
but not for commercial use. And we'll talk about the different licenses and their restrictions there. Or um, it depends. Some licenses require you to give attribution. Some don't. Um, the example here, CC0, does not require attribution. We'll talk about that again. But some of them require you to say where you got that. And you'll notice that in a lot of applications in the settings, like in apps, it's usually in the app settings in the app. Um, for desktop applications, it's usually just in the file structure. There is a folder called licenses where they will talk about all of the different things that they used and the license that they used them under. So it's, it's just like a very common thing that is kind of like the undercurrent of all open source work. And you can also use it for other creative works. So that is kind of what open source and creative commons is. Feel free to ask questions. But now we are going to take a look at first, we're going to talk about open source licenses. And then we're going to talk about Creative Commons because most of y'all have already been exposed to open source. That is the wrong link. Most of y'all have already been exposed to open source licenses before. So now if I share my screen. Ta-da! This is on the Wikipedia page for open source, and it shows the most common licenses, which you might recognize. I know that I used to, when I was writing code and uploading it to my GitHub, I would always choose an MIT license. There's Apache license, there's GPL, BSD. There are a whole bunch of licenses. And we can see this sort of breakdown of what the most common licenses are. And this is a very good article if you're looking to get, again, the background of open source, which goes into basically the idea of like, how are we going to share this like burgeoning industry of, of writing this code? Because the way that the US government and IP law was working and, and developing, it made sense to deliberately make a like system for licensing that work out to people in an easy way. Um, there's also this, this image I thought was also very good to talk about, which is the difference between FOSS, free and open source software and freeware, which is whether or not, so FOSS is often free of cost, freeware is free of cost, but the term usually describes gratis proprietary software. In essence, the difference is freeware is software that you're allowed to use for free in certain circumstances, but you are not able to to interact with the code whereas free and open source software is code that you're able to interact with and able to see you're able to peek under the hood so to speak this is again just like a good article to get the background of open source licensing we we aren't going to go too deep into the history of it but we are going to take a look at it is a quite overwhelming list but here we have an open source license comparison grid. And this is a resource that I'm going to be giving you all at the end. It looks overwhelming and that's because it is overwhelming. It's a lot, but we can use this as a reference for we found something and we want to try using it. And this is a much faster way of being able to see what it is and is not. Uh, is that similar to academic license? So we can see the academic license is on here um, as an example of some of the different types of licenses. Um, so I think you were referring to the difference between free and open source software and um, freeware. And yes, that is like a fairly good example where like I know that there are, what's a good example? I think some CAD software is free for students, but you don't actually have access to any of what the software is doing. You, you are just allowed to use it. And then that access expires as soon as you aren't a student and it's only for non-commercial use. That is like an example of a licensing agreement. So in this case, an open source license kind of codifies that. And let's take a look at some of the most common ones, which are listed along here. Can you please share the link to this PDF resource? Yes, I will. I can do that right now. And then I will also share this at the end. So that is that link. And let's take a look at, again, we saw that MIT was a very common license and we can take a look and it is this row right here. So let's take a look at what that means. Oh goodness. Okay. 
So our MIT license means our work is available for commercial use. It is available for distribution. It is available for modification. But if we were to use it in a project, we would not be able to patent that project. You can see there, patent use. It's available for private use. Um, and we do not need to disclose the source. So in essence, there are some, like we can see here, uh, same license, which says, da -da -da. okay. I know, yeah, there are a bunch of different GNU licenses, but there's the idea of a share alike. Ah, okay, that's a Creative Commons concept. But I'll, I'm going to talk about this right now because, um, okay, yes, it is the GNU General Public License. I thought so. Okay, so right here, the GNU General Public License 3.0 has same license listed, which means that if you make any work using that, your work needs to be licensed under the GNU Public License. Um, same with, again, we have here Creative Commons share alike 4.0, same license. So if I were to make something using something licensed under either of those two things, if I were to use a piece of code, if I were to use a piece of artwork, my entire project would need to continue that like path of open sourceness. And the goal of this is if like you were to build something on top of, let's say there is an image processor that is super efficient for compressing web images and blah, 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 blah. And you use that in your project and it turns out that your project is the next big social media platform. In this instance, the purpose of that license is that now your social media platform needs to be open source. So you are continuing to give back to that community um, as opposed to a license like the MIT license where it is not required to be licensed under the same license. Hopefully that makes sense. So yeah, green dots are something that you have full permission to use. Blue is something that are conditions around and red have limitations. So in essence, um, oh, I believe, let me double check. Hold liable. Software is provided without warranty and the software license owner cannot be held liable for damages. In essence, you are using this in... I like that that is the name of license. Um, but you are... When you are using software that is licensed under one of these licenses, if something goes wrong, if you were to use this in a nuclear power plant and the nuclear power plant were to blow up because of an error in that open source code, it's not their fault. Um, hold liable. Hopefully this is making sense. I know that licensing can be kind of complicated and I just want to show how you would use a resource like this where you have the descriptions in the bottom and then you can just find the license that you're using. I'm going to give people a sec if they have any questions. So we looked at the MIT license and what that looks like. But let's also look at Apache. So we'll see that Apache allows you to use it for patents, does not require source disclosure, but, oh, um, it's really complicated licensing trademarks, et cetera. Yeah, it, it can be very complicated, but I'm just trying to show like really in essence, you just need to look at these first couple of is something, and you'll notice that all of these licenses are, are under that, of is it available for commercial use? Am I able to distribute it? Am I able to modify it? Um, disclose source states whether or not you need to, if you use it, disclose the source code of what you've made. Again, MIT doesn't, but GNU does. Um, that sort of thing. So you can just use this as a reference when you find a piece of work that you want to use. Again, there are a lot of different licenses, but you will only come across them on occasion. Does anyone have any questions about that? We're going to talk at the end. I'm going to go over... Oh, 
Uh, what if someone takes your open source project, changes it a little bit and starts selling it? What would we do in that situation? Okay, so let's take a look at, so you've, you've made an open source project and let's say that again, you used an MIT license. That's just a very common one. And it's the one that I usually used. Um, I'll get to this question in a second. Um, under the MIT license, we can see that anything released under that license uh, can be used for commercial purposes. So they could sell it and the person can distribute it themselves and they can modify it. So if you release something under the MIT license and someone modifies it, they can sell it. Um, that is like, again, let's see if I have a good example of an app on my phone that has a list of licenses. Um, ooh, here's a good one. Settings. Ooh, uh, the Google Keep app, I believe. Keep notes. I'm trying to think about, there was a point where I was really settings. Ugh! I found a very good app that just had a list of licenses that was a paid app. So it was an app that I had paid for that was using existing open source software. Uh, I believe it might have been either a, a ebook reader or an audiobook player. Either way, they used existing open source software in their project and they were now allowed to monetize that project. Um, in essence, that is kind of the point of open source is that open source isn't just designed for it to be continued. If you do want it to be continued, then you put it under a GNU general public license. So it is share alike and same license. So someone, yes, could change it and they could use it commercially and they could do all of these things, but they also need to make their code open source. Um, a good example of that might be Bitwarden license. Um, oh, this is security licenses. Here we go. Okay. So Bitwarden is a password manager, but it is licensed under the GNU public license version 3.0, which means that they used, yeah, there we go. They used, they either used or they wanted to license their code as, but probably slightly both, um, code that is under the GNU public license. And um, in essence, what that means is that this is a password manager, but their code is available online. And it is a paid password manager. People pay to use Bitwarden. There are free versions available, but people pay in order to have different features and better hosting and all of these things. And also stream stopped. Okay, no, it looks like it's fine on my end. Okay. Oh, but this is an example of a project that this is a paid commercial project. This is a large company. Large. It's, it's, a, it's a company. It is an established company. I should phrase it that way. And they used uh, share alike and copy left licensed code. And now their project is open source. Open source password management. Wait. Linear mouse? I thank you for this. That is actually extremely useful. I currently am using a uh, USB overdrive, right? Yeah, USB overdrive, which is an example of shareware, by the way, or freeware, which is I'm able to use this for free, but there is this pop-up every time. WinRAR is another famous example of that. Thank you for this. So that hopefully answered your question 
of what if someone took your open source project, changed it a little bit and started selling it. That's okay. That's a thing that people can do. Um, I'm sure that VLC, uh, video LAN controller, y'all know VLC media player. Um, it is, I'm like 90% sure open source. What is it licensed under? Yeah, okay. It's licensed under GNU General Public License. So VLC is an example of a piece of software that um I know what you're referring to, FFmpeg. Um But VLC you can distribute and uh, modify it, do whatever you want with it. And because it is GNU General Public License V2, let's take a look here. Great, that's right here. Um, it can't be patented. And the source code must be made available when distributing the software. But, ah, and it needs to be licensed under the same license. So you could take VLC and you could add your own things on top of it and you could sell it, but you would need to make sure that the source code was available. So theoretically, could someone clone the Bitwarden repository and monetize it under a different name without making any changes? So here's where I would like to say that I am not a lawyer and that I am... 20 years old and I know this based on the things that I've read on like the Wikipedia pages and reading all the licensing guides from these organizations and things like that so take everything that I say with a grain of salt and also kind of yeah so in order to comply with that license um, someone could take Bitwarden or VLC in this case either one of them they're both licensed under very similar licenses and they as long as they made the source code open source they could have you pay to install the application itself, if that makes sense. Why would someone use paid Bitwarden clone if they can use free Bitwarden? Yeah, so that is also the question. There is the argument there of like, people don't know about open source. So there's like a level of like, you can convince people who don't necessarily know about what's happening to buy your product. But also like if, if I were to take VLC, which is a very common media player application. And I were to be like, ooh, uh, I'm going to make it work so much better with the like specific M1 architecture on MacBooks. And I did a whole bunch of optimization and I did all of these things. And then I released it as my own thing that cost $5 in the Mac App Store. I can do that as long as the code is available for people to use and look at. But most people don't want to download the code for something and build it themselves. You don't need to distribute the built application, if that makes sense. Does that does that give you an example of how you can have a paid and open source like thing that's all the same, where it can be open source and also a paid piece of software? This also, most people don't take something as large as Bitwarden and use that. They will take something that is like, uh, what's a good example of, let's see what React is licensed under. Okay, so React is licensed under an MIT license. Which means, which, ooh, okay, this is a perfect example. React.js is a, like, a, a library, a framework, that sort of jazz. I'm blanking on the perfect term for it. I think framework. Um, that allows you to build things uh, with React. And React is open source. But if we take a look here, and also you'll notice that... GitHub has a little license thing right here where we can see that we can use it for commercial use, we can modify it, we can distribute it, we can use it for private uses. But if we look here, 
the MIT license does not require you to dis disclose source or require it to be under the same license. So someone can build something in React, which they are using open source software, and have a paid app that runs on React. This is an example of using open source software to make something commercial. Someone can take React and use it to build something, but people wouldn't take React and sell React as it is, if that makes sense. So again, that's why React is licensed under the MIT license, because it was if it were licensed under a GNU general public license, it would require that everything built on React share its source code and be open source itself, which means that a lot fewer people would use React. I think that is the best example here. Um, okay, let me scroll up. There was a question earlier. Is there any particular license you would recommend for a beginner developer slash open source contributor. So the thing is here, if you are contributing to an existing open source project, your code will be licensed under the same license that the project is licensed under. So if I were contributing to React, all of the code that I contribute to React is part of React and React is licensed under MIT. So you don't need to choose when you are developing for some existing open source software. When you are releasing your own software, this is where it's really up to you. And also I want to say that statistically, especially as students, given who we are, that most of us are learning, most of us are not high power industry professionals who like have a ton of people looking at everything we write because everything we write is incredible and groundbreaking. The license that you choose does not necessarily matter because your code is not the code that people are going to be looking to use. I think it is cool to put all of your code open source as a way of showing off to like job applications and things like that, letting people see your work. And also you can choose whatever license you want. Again, I licensed under the MIT license usually. Um, <laughs> wait a sec, you obviously haven't seen my code. I mean, I haven't. I did say that most of us probably aren't. Um, So I, really you can choose like any of the popular ones. I think if you want to make sure that no one can take your code and make something closed source with it, license it under GNU um, public access. I'm double checking. God, I cannot remember for the life of me, the names of these licenses. I'm very bad with names. Uh, GNU general public license. You can license it under that. If you want people to just be able to see your code and do whatever they want with it, MIT license. That's generally the distinction that I make. Um, okay. Here's a great question. Suppose if I fork that open source software, then can I get access to all of the passwords? This is an example of what is and what isn't licensed under an open source license. So Bitwarden's code is licensed under a GNU public access license, but their, their data, their servers, their architecture, all of that stuff that is not the actual code itself is not licensed under that. The only thing that is licensed under that is the code itself. So their logo isn't licensed under that. They probably have a trademark on that logo. It is only for the code itself. I think React, showing React and Bitwarden are the best examples that I can come up with of the differences in how I literally created a repo with the MIT license this morning and then I remembered the session and started wondering if I'd messed up. I don't think it is like, I remember when I first released code to open source, I spent a lot of time looking at these licenses because I was like, I want to make sure that like I get credit when this blows up and gets really big, but I just like made a small website using bootstrap. Like I think it is important to look at the largest and most used open source software. And it is the software that either has been around for a really long time. Like VLC is a great example where, um, Ooh, Android is another great example of something that is open source, but also Google has a proprietary version. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, where I wanted to make sure that no one could like steal my code. And if you are concerned about that, I would use a GNU public access license of like, Hey, this is free and open. And also if you use this, you need to make sure that your stuff is free and open as well. Um, there also might be, let's see if there's a license here that requires
So, Creative Commons. Ooh. Um, so, I'm dropping this link because this is what we're going to look at next, which is choosealicense.com, which will help you. But I want to talk about a couple things that just came up. Um... We're going to talk about Android in a sec. A trademark and a patent are the same thing, question mark? No, they are different. This is where law gets confusing as heck. But a trademark... So there's a trademark, copyright, and a patent. As like the three main things, at least in US ownership law. Wow, my camera... Is just looking weirder and weirder. I'm looking sort of yellow, but I'll just let that happen. It's gonna do what it's gonna do. A so a trademark. In essence, I think of a trademark as something that covers something small, like a logo or a name or a catchphrase. Um, it is something that is associated with your your business, and you don't want anyone else using that because it would it would hurt your business. So I can't like. If I were to make a gun and I were to say, like, this gun is, like, 17 times more deadly than every other gun, I were to slap a Coca-Cola logo on it. Coca or Disney. Disney is a great example here. Disney would obviously not like that because they don't want their brand associated with my 17 next gun or whatever. Um, so they have a trademark over the Disney logo and over Disney the name. I couldn't say made by Disney because they have a trademark on Disney. Um, there's also probably a lot of other legal stuff there. So that's that's a, a trademark. A patent would be, to continue the gun example, whatever mechanism I created to make it 17 times more effective, ugh, I really don't like guns. Um, whatever I created, the like physical process, the mechanism, medication is an example of something that can be patented. Um, cameras, phones, all of these, like the technology basically something that is is like functional that serves a purpose that is patented and a patent lasts for roughly 20 years and then it is released to the public which is why things like generic medications exist where originally medications are created they are patented and then 20 years well the way the patent system is supposed to work without corporate lobbying is 20 years after that is created, then it is released to everyone. So everyone can use that. Ooh, a great example of something that I've been looking at. Uh, I had a bunch of Legos as a child, but I don't have them anymore for a variety of reasons. And I was looking to get some of my favorite sets. But um, getting old discontinued Lego sets is extremely expensive. But the Lego patent on the shape of their bricks has expired, which means that you can legally create Lego bricks that just don't have the Lego name on them. Because again, Lego has a trademark on Lego, but the patent on the shape and interconnectivity of the bricks has expired, at least for majority of bricks. I'm sure that there are some new things that they've created that are still patented. So there are a whole bunch of like Wee Brick is an example. Wee Brick is a company that sells Lego compatible building bricks. A friend of mine got a cease and desist letter for his uh, t-shirt business, Eat More Kale from Chick-fil-A for using the words Eat More. Yeah, they probably had a trademark on Eat More. Okay, this is struggling to load, but in essence, what this is saying is this is something that is like using the fact that patents expire to build things that are compatible with Lego. Uh, and then copyright is for something that is like a creative work in my mind. So a movie is copyright, songs, writing, that sort of thing. That's why all of the controversy on YouTube is around copyright, um, because no one's going to get mad if you're, well, there are times 
where people get mad. There are video essayists or journalists and things like that who make these exposés about different companies, and then they use the company's logo, and the company uses that as grounds to try taking down the video. There's all this stuff. It's it's a law. It's a whole thing. But that's the difference, roughly, between copyright and patents. Um, Android is just another example of there is an open source version of Android, and I have a Google Pixel, and I can install the open source version of Android, but it won't come with the Google Play Store. Because the Google Play Store is not open source. Google's apps are not open source. So it, I can use the operating system that is under the open source license. But Google has added their own proprietary stuff to it. And then they can now charge to device manufacturers to use Google's proprietary version. Um... Yeah, I saw that happen to some YouTubers. Yeah, it's a fairly common thing. Okay, let's talk about, so I had, we've been looking at this chart and then I saw at the bottom, Grid and Legend by choosealicense.com, which, hey, oh, look, I want it per, uh, simple and permissive. The MIT license is short and to the point. It lets people do almost anything they want with your project, like making it and distributing it, closed source versions. Babel, .NET and Rails use the MIT license. I care about sharing improvements. The GNU GPL v3 lets people do almost anything they want to your project except distributing closed source versions. Ansible, Bash, and GIMP use GPL v3. And then I need to work in a community. The use the license preferred by your community you're contributing to or depending on. Your project will fit right in. So this is a very good description of what the different choices are. So if you're contributing to an existing open source project, use that license. If you want it simple and just for anyone to use it for basically whatever, use dot or use MIT. And if you care about sharing improvements, use GPL3. If you want more choices, here's the list of all of their different, oh, this is, okay. I'm sharing this website again, because this is much better and much easier to use than that grid. Uh, here is a large block of text around what happens if you don't include a license. And then non-software licenses, you'll see that there are a bunch of different licenses, including all of these CCs, Creative Commons, which are gonna be what we're talking about next. So yeah, choosealicense.com. I think that is everything that I wanted to talk about with regards to CCs are copyrights. So, yes, mm, yes, yes, yes. That took me a sec to parse in my brain, but you, you, CCs are copyright. Oh, you mean the letters CC. So the C in a circle is the copyright symbol. But the letters CC together, that stands for Creative Commons. Every YouTuber also has a CC. That's closed captions as well. There are many different CCs. So there's the copyright symbol. There's the closed caption symbol which is another form of CC and then there's the creative commons symbol which is this hopefully that makes things make a little bit more sense of all the different very similar different pictures I'm going to give people a sec if they have any more questions about open source licenses before I move on to Creative Commons. Also, feel free to ask questions at any time. So, it is not... Creative Commons is a type of copyright. 
copyright is not, there are not multiple types of copyright. Copyright is a legal idea that if you made something, you can give people the right or not the right to make copies of it, the, the copyright. So if I were to write a book, someone can't just make their own copies of my book. A Creative Commons license is a specific license around the copyright rights, if that makes sense. So when you're saying Creative Commons is a type of copyright, the idea is the exact same. You're on the right track, but the phrasing there is weird. Um, not to get off on a tangent, but this is why so many artists, writers, etc., are suing for their work being used to train AI. Yep because they used work they weren't licensed to use. So there are a bunch of different... I know Adobe Firefly is supposedly trained on work that they had the rights to use. So it'll be work that is listed under Creative Commons License Zero, um, which CC Zero will talk about. It's also called Public Domain. Uh, and, and other things like that, work that they've actually licensed. And that is supposedly more ethical. I will again restate that I don't think there's any ethical AI in existence, and I don't think there ever can be. There is no ethical computation under capitalism. AI systems are built on the unpaid and underpaid labor of people who are, uh, the term is underemployed, where it is like, ugh, in an ideal world, someone would have a job that pays them well enough to survive, but if you can't get that job and you are in some place like a refugee camp, you do what you can to make the money that you can. And a lot of ways that people make that money is by working to label data for AI companies. Um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk is a huge example of this. Anyway, this is to say AI has a whole bunch of other things. Um, where are my channel points? <clears throat> yeah, so we're on, we're on MLH Red, which is a different channel. And also because of that, my stream is an entirely different setup, as you might notice when I share my screen. Um, so I don't have access to any of that either. Hence why like TTS and stuff isn't working. Anyway, that's, that's how the AI controversy ties into this. But let's talk about Creative Commons licensing. Do, 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 do. Is another hackathon going on? Yes, there is. I'm blanking on which what hackathon it is. Um, it is all in hackathon that is happening right now. So they are using the main Twitch channel throughout the next couple of days. Okay. Um, sorry, give me a sec. Can an arbitrary person change their license whenever they want? For instance, can React suddenly make, change their license to GNU? I, so there are two things here. Well, one, I don't really know actually, but two, the license that it is under is for that specific moment. So if you were to use a version of React, if you were to use React right now, and tomorrow they were to say like, hey, we are now using a GNU license, your work is still under the MIT license because that was when you used it. But then if you were to update React and you were to use a new version of React, then you would be subject to the new license. So I don't know how that works. Um, for like your personal project, yeah, you could change it at any point you want. It is just words. Um, but for larger projects like that, where they're being used, um, when they're being used by tons of different people, there are probably much larger legal repercussions. So I don't necessarily know the answer to that one. Um, channel points, channel points. Uh, how do you get involved in MLH? Just doing hackathons, like probably the rest of y'all. I started doing hackathons, and then I just became more and more involved in the community, started mentoring, helping out at hackathons, and then somehow I ended up here. Do you want to try Arc and Warp or Min Browser? Are you referring to Arc Browser? Because if you are, that is the browser that I use on the day-to-day -day basis. When I stream, I use Firefox 
and Chrome for compatibility reasons. Um, but I use Arc as my main day-to-day -day browser. Yeah. Um, hey, I'm glad you liked All In. Um, yeah, I think they can update the license in terms of service. I get emails all the time. Yeah. So again, it is moving forward. So that is, yeah, that is actually a great example where terms of service updates all the time. And then whenever you're trying to use this new piece of software, it will require you to click a button and say like, oh, oh yeah, okay. I, I acknowledge the new terms of service because what you were doing before is licensed or with the terms of service in the past and what you will do in the future is on the new one. Okay. Hopefully that answered all the questions. Great. Again, feel free to keep asking questions. Let's talk about Creative Commons licenses. <laughs> Hello? Um, okay. So Creative Commons licenses give everyone from individual creators to large institutions a standardized way to grant the public permission to use their creative work under copyright law. So again, it is a way of working within and under copyright law. From the reuser's perspective, the presence of a Creative Commons license on a copyright work answers the question, what can I do with this work? Again, a really great description. So there are six different types of licenses listed from most to least permissive here. So this is at the bottom, the least, uh, are we going to talk about when we use? Yes, we are. So we talked about that at the beginning with humans, um, but we're going to continue talking about this. 404, it is totally fine. TTS is not working because as you can tell, we are on a completely different stream setup. Uh, yeah. So next month I should be back to having TTS and channel points and all of those things. But for this stream, we don't have them. And then on the next stream that I'm doing, next stream that I'm doing, I'm doing a mini event tomorrow, um, which is going to be on Discord. Yeah, Global Hack Week's almost over. It's just today and tomorrow, and tomorrow ends at noon. So, yeah, it's been it's been a really good time, but we'll soon need to wait until next month. That being said, let's talk about Creative Commons licenses. So you'll notice that they have both these symbols and also these acronyms. Um, and when we were looking at human humans before, and we saw CC0, which we'll talk about. Uh, Tintin's another person in chat. Um, will Dimmer, I don't use Discord y'all. Oh, I'm sorry. I literally just use it to post announcements. I have like a small, like private friend group discord that I use a different account for. Like I, yeah, I'm not really big. A lot of people ask me like, where are your socials? Like I do not use social media. It just does not work with my brain. It's nothing against you 404. Okay. So again, if we are making something that is not necessarily code, but is something creative, it would be something that is copyrightable. So if we are creating a song, if we are creating a written work, if we are creating a video, if we are creating a photo, if we are creating really anything that is creative, uh, it is copyrighted. So there are different license options that we can use. The default, I want to restate this, the default if you do not choose one of these licenses is that you retain all the copyright information. You retain everything. So you do not need to license something if you don't want other people to use it. You can post something to the internet and not include a Creative Commons license, not include any license, and you have full ownership over that thing. You can publish a book uh, self-published to the internet somewhere and you will still have full copyright over that information. I just want to state that that is the default state. This is ways in where we are allowing people more freedom and flexibility to use something that we have made. Okay. So we have CCBY, which we can click on each of these and we get a very 
beautiful breakdown. I love the Creative Commons website. I'm going to drop this in chat. Uh, even my Twitter is dead at this point. So this is the website that we're currently looking at. So we have CCBY. This license enables users to distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon the material in any medium or format, so long as attribution is given to the creator. This license allows for commercial use. So, in essence, if you are licensing something and you're okay with... Y'all, um... I just really quickly want to address what people are talking about. Um... So one of the things that is beautiful and wonderful about MLH is the fact that the community welcomes anyone from anywhere to participate. And that includes people who I know that like a lot of y'all are in India and places like that. Um, I'm from good old US of A, so English is my only language, but there are plenty of people who their English might not be great and they might not actually speak really any English. Um, and they might be able to to listen and understand, but not be able to write very well. They might be able to speak and not read, or there, there are a whole bunch of different ways that people learn language. Um, and I just want to make sure that this is a safe space for everyone, regardless of their like language skills, because we can learn, we can be part of a community, we can share space together. Um, so yeah, the, the chat user that y'all are talking about might speak in like a formal way and might use messages frequently between chats because those are the messages that they like copy and paste to reuse because they know that they got the English understandable in that one and they might not feel comfortable chatting otherwise. So I just want to make sure that like they aren't a bot, they're like a person like you and they're a part of this community. And I want to make sure that we create a welcoming space for that. Just wanted to take a pause and talk about that. Because, yeah, like, I I don't know. I can see the, like, ways in which I am extremely privileged to have English as my, like, first language where it is, like, I don't know. I took, like, high school Spanish, and I was terrible at it. I was not very good. And I am glad that all of the, like, spaces that I want to interact in and learn in allow me to use my native language. Whereas a lot of y'all, if not probably statistically most of y'all, English is not your first language. So I just want to make sure that we aren't talking poorly about someone because of the way that they talk in chat. Thanks, y'all. With that, let's keep talking about Creative Commons. So again, CCBY. In essence, you're releasing something into the world and you're like, feel free to reuse it even commercially, but I want attribution. I want credit. So if someone were to release a like extremely good photo of a tree and you're writing a blog post about different types of beautiful trees and you want to use that photo, you would just say photo by whomever. Um, and you'll see that across all of these different places um, on the internet where people like have work that is released for attribution. Um, and there are a whole bunch of other ways outside of Creative Commons. Creative Commons is the most similar to open source. That's why we're talking about it. But there are a whole bunch of different ones there. Um, CCBYSA, Creative Commons. Um, I, I don't know what the, so I know the SA is share alike, but I don't know what the BY is. I want to know what that stands for. Oh, it's by. Because you're talking about what the, that this was made by a person. Okay. So anyway, we have CCBY, by, and then share alike. In essence, this license enables users to distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon the material in any medium or format, so long as attribution is given to the creator. The license allows for commercial use. 
if you remix, adapt, or build upon the material, you must license the modified material under identical terms. So if someone were to release a really cool character onto the internet um, for, ooh, we'll, we'll talk about this, of like where I've used these on stream with y'all before, but if someone were to create a cool character on the internet and you were to make a comic book using the different images that they had made of that character, uh, and that character were to be licensed under CC BY share alike, what you can do is, is you can release this and you can monetize it and you can do all of those things, but your work also needs to be licensed under Creative Commons attribution. So anyone could use your comic book and let's say make a movie based on it, but they would just need to give you attribution. So you'll notice that we've taken the Creative Commons attribution license and we have just added share alike to it to the end and here we have nc so we have the creative commons attribution license with nc which is only non-commercial works are permitted so you can't make money off of it this is a great example of something that you might find something that you want to use in your hackathon project well your hackathon project isn't going to be a commercial use so you can use that and we are just adding nc and we can see that we have ccbyncsa which is a creative commons license that includes attribution is non-commercial and is share alike and then we have nd no derivatives or adaptations of the work are permitted so if i were to release something you could use it in its its whole self if i were to release a picture you could use that picture in your blog but you could not take that picture and make it 8-bit and put it in the background of your video game um it is only allowed in its unadapted form only and then you can add NC to that, non-commercial, and I'm sure you could also add SA to that to be share-alike. So it really just gives you these tools to choose what you do and don't want. And we're going to talk about that tool. And then CC0, public domain dedication. CC0 is a public domain dedication tool which enables creators to give up their copyright and put their works into the worldwide public domain. CC0 enables reusers to distribute, remix, adapt, and build upon the material in any medium or format with no conditions. This is something that I really want to talk about because the public domain is something that exists where I talked about how a patent after 20 years expires, and now anyone can use what was talked about in that patent. Theoretically, of some theoretically copyright expires as well so an example of this recently uh was winnie the pooh winnie the pooh went into the public domain so you can use any of the original winnie the pooh stories to do whatever you want with you could make a comic book adaptation you could make a movie you could make a horror remix you could make a horror video game you could literally take it in its entirety and post it on amazon as a book under your own name and that's fine because it's in the public domain in essence, this has been around long enough that people can do whatever they want with it. Um, Pride and Prejudice is an example of a work that is under public domain. So there was Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, a, I believe, TV show or maybe a movie that was a very popular um, like remix of that original work. Um, oh, for those of you who know about the Green Brothers, who are some of my favorite people on the internet, Hank Green... Some of y'all might know him from uh, TikTok, but he created, if I can find it, the Green Brothers are amazing, yes. The Lizzie Bennet Diaries. This is a web series that was adaptation of basically a vlog adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. And it was made, when was it made? 2012. So this was like early vlogging days. And it won a Webby for an outstanding creative achievement in interactive media. And it is an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. This is an example of a work, Pride and Prejudice, that is in the public domain and anyone can do whatever they want with it. So yes, you could create a Winnie the Pooh intercontinental ballistic missile, but it won a Webby, not a Webby, an Emmy. The like, this is before the Webbies existed. Like the Television Academy Emmy Awards. Yeah, some 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 really big stuff. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about assets and tools in a bit. Oh, but yeah, you can use Winnie the Pooh with, for whatever you want. Except, here's the thing. Creative or copyright works are supposed to go into public domain. But there are a lot of businesses that build copyright material that have been around for a long time. And the example here that is infamous is Disney. Disney's original movies, the movies that they are well known for, such as the animated Cinderella. Cinderella is a public domain work. Disney took this public domain work and made their own adaptation of it. And now they work really, really hard to make sure that, um, I keep getting distracted by chat. Uh, Disney makes really sure, works really hard to make sure that copyrighted material does not go into public domain until I believe it is currently 79 years after the death of the author, which is insane and extreme. And it should not be that long. Um, in, in my opinion, I believe that copyright should be much shorter to allow people to make remixes and build upon things. Um, so yeah, Winnie the Pooh, the original book is public domain, but Disney's Winnie the Pooh is not. So you cannot depict Winnie the Pooh in a red shirt because that is a different character that is still Disney's copyright. So Winnie the Pooh without a red shirt, totally free to put on your intercontinental ballistic missile. Winnie the Pooh with a red shirt, Disney. Um, okay, let me look through chat. So that is public domain is a thing that exists and is incredibly cool. And there's tons of amazing stuff. Um, the, I believe the Gutenberg project. Project Gutenberg is a, oh goodness. Ugh. Is a collection of ebooks and things like that. So, uh, they get a lot of backlash. We're talking about separate things. I'm going to talk about what you're talking about in a sec. The Gutenberg Project, um, is almost yeah. Everything from Project Gu Gutenberg is gratis, library, and completely without cost to readers. In essence, they mostly most of their stuff is public domain works, works that are old enough that there are the there is no longer any copyright over them. So they can be redistributed in any way that they want. I believe what you are referring to, oh wait, I wasn't sharing my screen there. Project Gutenberg. They share old books basically. But um, the internet archive has a library of free books, movies, software, music, websites, and more. And also, they have a lot of copyrighted material. So I don't necessarily know how to navigate this website very well. How do I borrow a book? Books are generally available for renewable one-hour loans. In essence, they have a library that distributes over the internet. That's how they would argue it. But um, over COVID, they were like, hey, people can't go to actual libraries. We're going to stop doing these like one hour loans and just let people download stuff. And there was a massive li uh, a lawsuit against them by all of these copyright holders, specifically um, from the book publishers, not necessarily the authors, but more the publishers. Uh, saying, hey, you can't do that. That's copyright infringement. So Project Gutenberg, uh, public domain, the Internet Archive, I would argue that this is good, <laughs> um, but generally is controversy around it. Um, it is the same organization that runs the Wayback Machine. Yes, but they do a lot more than that. Generally, they, they're just trying to act as an archive. Um, Uh, the Gutenberg Press was responsible for the mass distribution of the printed words. Some controversy if it was actually the Gutenberg Press specifically. Ah, good to know. I know about the Gutenberg Press theoretically and like the Gutenberg Bible, but I don't know much about the details. Um, 
So there is a thing that is put in chat that is a link. Um, that I can neither approve nor disapprove of because I don't know what MLH's stance is on piracy. Um, because piracy is the act of taking and distributing um, copyrighted material. And there are places that I am not going to name, but uh, um, that allow you to download books from the internet for free. And there are plenty of these places. And uh, one might have been linked in chat, but I don't know. Not at all. Um, yeah, libgen.rs is a really bad site and gives books for free. Don't go there. Um, yeah, there are a whole bunch of different really bad ways of specifically a lot of textbooks for free, um, which is horrible and atrocious. And these textbook publishers really, really deserve um, hundreds and hundreds of dollars every semester for the same textbook over and over again. But they've just changed the order of the chapters slightly so you can't use old copies. Anyway, I didn't say that. No one was talking about that. What were we talking about? Anyway, so that's, that is the, the concept of public domain. And it is cool because CC0 allows you to say that, hey, my work, I'm not dead. It, my work, when you make something, you have copyright over it. And it automatically goes into the public domain 79 years after the author's death. I'm not dead. It hasn't been 79 years, but I want my work to be part of the public domain CC0. Uh, for those of you who... Kenny... Ooh, I think that NL... Um, oh, I spelled Kenny wrong. Anyway, Kenny.nl. This is a person who creates game assets free for you to use. And this is where we were using, we were using these game assets um, in our Godot stream. And if we look at assets, and let's take a look at Pixel Platformer, Food Expansion, The License, Creative Commons, CC0. This is part of the public domain. You can do whatever you want with it. There are no restrictions. It, this content is free for use in personal, educational, and commercial projects. Written permission is not required. Support us by crediting or donating. Voluntary. So in essence, you can do whatever, whatever you want with Creative Commons work. Um, which a lot of these assets are Creative Commons. Everything I believe that Kenny has created is Creative Commons. Um, again, humans that we were looking at is Creative Commons. Uh, when I've been looking for, let's take a look at itch.io game assets. This is an example that is really clear to talk about where when we're talking about game assets, you might make a game that is open source, but the artwork in that game is going to be um, uh, copyrighted. So we can use Creative Commons work here. So if we search for free, and let's take a look at this first one, Spratland Assets Pack. Looks very cute. This is absolutely adorable. And if we scroll down, free version license. This asset pack can be used in any non-commercial project. You may modify the assets as you wish. This assets pack can't be used in any commercial product, resold, or redistributed, even if modified. We have the license right there. Now, they aren't using a direct Creative Commons license, um, but the closest one would be... There is no redistribution. Yeah, okay, that's why it can't be a Creative Commons license because they are not allowing the distribution of their work. So in essence, you can use it, but you can't distribute it. Therefore, it's not Creative Commons. Let's see. Oh, 
I saw license. Oh my goodness. I saw it somewhere in here. Okay. Here is the license. You can edit and use the asset in any commercial or non-commercial project. Use the asset in any commercial or non-commercial project. You cannot resell or distribute or edit and resell the asset to others. So these, again, these aren't using Creative Commons licenses. Some of them are. But in essence, we now have the tools. Yeah, you may not repackage, redistribute. We have the tools to be able to understand these different licenses and specifically look out for that CC0 license because that is the most permissive. In essence, they are giving up all claim to that work. So that's Creative Commons licensing. Uh, ooh, there is a tool that I want to talk about. That is the... Here we go. The license chooser that allows you to select a license. So do I know which license? No. Do you want attribution? No, anyone can use my work. Hey, oh, look, I should use CC0. But if I want attribution, then okay. It's recommending CCBY. And I want no commercial use. No. And then, hey, oh, look, it's giving you your Creative Commons license. Um, Again, Creative Commons licenses inherently allow for redistribution. Um, so if you don't want that, again, those people just defined their own licenses using similar language. But that is Chooser Creative Commons. So we have that, and then we have, what was the link for earlier? Oh, goodness. Choosealicense.com. as the two different tools that we have, depending on what you've made to be able to choose a license that does what you want to do and allows people to reuse your work in the way that you want to use it. So you have choose a license for open source licenses, and then we have the Creative Commons licensor, license chooser, right here. That, I believe, is, yeah, everything that I wanted to go over today. Um, really quickly, someone was like, is it just me or is stream quality a lot lower today? It will be, um, in essence, when I stream based on my own stuff, uh, I have stripped out all of the processing that I can because I trust myself and know what I'm doing. This tool that MLH uses has more safety guards built in and as such, the quality is lower. So it is basically any stream that'll run through the software will come out good enough where people will be able to understand you and able to see you but you might not get that crispy sharp detail whereas with me i have no guardrails so i might completely mess it up and it might be unwatchable but also you can get that crispy detail but i still can do things like this and things like this because that's based on the stuff that is around me so the music and the video is going through hardware but the way it is processed makes it slightly worse Okay, I've now talked about everything that I've wanted to talk about. And we have like 30, 25, 30 minutes remaining. So if you all have any questions, we can talk about those. Or if you all want to hang out, we can talk about something else. Or we can do something else entirely. Because now, now, now it is your time. My lecture is finished. And now it is your time. I've covered all the information I wanted to cover. I've given an intro over all of this. And the main goal of this is not that you have all of this memorized, but you will have the tools to be able to look at something and be like, oh, I remember seeing this at one point or hearing about this. So you will know how to like Google and look stuff up and know that this stuff exists. 
thank you. Thank you for all the compliments. Did we finish the game? We were nowhere close to finishing the game. We still had like three hours worth of tutorial. Maybe less, more, more like two and a half hours to finish that game. So again, the links to that tutorial that we were following are in the description of the YouTube recordings of the stream. Dimmer, when are you streaming? Tomorrow. When am I streaming tomorrow? Uh, da, da, da. So it's the 22nd and it is Ah, okay. 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time on the 22nd, and we're going to be playing Gardic Phone in Discord. Do you know Mac users can just replace icons by dragging new icons in to get info? That's pretty cool. I know in Windows, it's just as simple as like right clicking properties, and you can change that. Um. 1 to 2 p.m. EST. Wait, are we EST or EDT? Just 1 to 2 p.m. ET, Eastern Time. <laughs> okay. Shem says we're in Eastern Daylight Time, EDT. But if you type ET into Google, let me give an example of this to make sure it works. Yeah. So you can just Google something like this, 1 p.m. ET to IST, and it'll convert. It has 1 p.m. Saturday in Eastern Time ET to whatever time zone you're in. So yeah, it's easier, I found, to just use ET whenever trying to convert these things, because then it'll deal with daylight savings time for you. Okay. So again, we have another like half hour. Ooh, skiddy. I see a lot of Web3 stuff going on the internet, but I'm not convinced it's concept like if we really need it. The crypto feels like a made up thing hyped up by people to make money, or is it just me and I have to learn more about it? So, I have personal opinions around Web3, and those personal opinions are mine and mine alone, and I'm going to talk about them, but take everything that I say with a grain of salt. So, Shem, it's good because it's decentralized IMHO. Web3 as a concept can be incredibly useful in specific instances. Um, but the people who are, let me be more specific, the influencers, the individual people who are pushing for general Web3 rather than specific like companies and institutions that are like, hey, we've created a system to help you incorporate Web3 into X, Y, or Z. There's a difference between using Web3 as like an architecture, a backend to help do the things that we're already doing. And from Web3 is the future for everything, put your medical records and your money and your house all on Web3. And the distinction there is I think that there are probably use cases of blockchain and decentralized technology that are going to be incredibly useful. Um, I know that Amazon and other companies like it are already using write-only databases for tracking all of these things. So maybe there's a way of using Web3 to do that. But there's a difference there between Web3 and specific things like Ethereum or block Bitcoin or any of these specific things, because those are financial assets. 
And there is this like idea in Web3 of making everything a financial asset that can be traded and bet on, including the people themselves. And that is my view on the way that people push. It, this is a lot less common now, but people are pushing Web3 as the future, as you'll need Web3 for everything, that everything will be stored in your crypto wallet. Well, if everything's stored in your crypto wallet, that means it's all public. And we've seen that people have their wallet addresses leaked all the time, and it is anonymous, anonymous, but it is public. So as soon as someone figures out what your wallet address is, they can see everything. So if my medical records were stored on the blockchain, and my like housing deed was stored on the blockchain, and I got paid on the blockchain, and I paid people on the blockchain, that meant that my boss would be able to see my medical records. And that meant that anyone that I paid would be able to see where I lived. And it is that that makes me upset around the, the shills who push for Web3 as a future concept rather than as a specific technology. Most, there are more companies building tools and services to implement Web3 than making something really impactful using the concept that solves a real problem. Web5 is gaining traction now too, touting personal web sovereignty. I have not even heard of Web5. Oh, I don't like that. Oh, God. Okay. I... I don't know what Web5 is. I'm not going to be able to learn enough about it in this next, like couple seconds to be able to to say something the reason why i had that such a strong reaction is because the problem that i see with the way that the web has progressed is that the skills required to exist on the internet have you you are not bumming me out you are not doing anything wrong shem i am bummed out by the like systems that are making it harder and harder for individuals to make things so one of the reasons that we went from web one to web two is that in web one, anyone could make a website. And now in web two, we have a lot more tools and things like that that can do incredible things on the web that we could never do before. This, this right here, I am live streaming through a web app to another web app that you're seeing. That would be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly hard, if not impossible to write using web one. And also because web two has become more complicated, it means that individual people are not able to make things as easily. So you need to go to platforms. It is much harder for me to be able to, oh, what's a good example? I can't necessarily like host, um, oh, great example, personal websites now. It used to be that you could throw together a personal website in like GeoCities and it wouldn't look beautiful and professional and stunning and all of these things. But it was possible for an average person to sit down for an afternoon and come away with a website. Now, creating a website that fits in with the rest of the internet, that is like a Web2 website, is almost impossible for the average person to do in a reasonable amount of time. So services like Squarespace and Wix and Weebly and all of these services exist that now can do that for you. In essence, Web1 was where the complexity was low enough that the average person could interact with it if they wanted to. Web 2, the complexity is increased such that the average person needs to use a third party service to do most of the things that they need to do. Hence, part of the reason, the consolidation for things on the internet as these services kind of combine together. Um, there's also a lot of just like capitalism at work that you're, but that is, that is my idea of the difference between Web 1 and Web 2. And when people talk about Web 3, they're talking about a return to like, again, the idea of returning personal sovereignty to the web. I'm gonna...
yeah, and some of these third-party services ask for money to build things. In essence, I don't think that any new web technology that promises decentralization can do so without reducing the complexity of the internet, which isn't going to happen. And I think the actual solution to these things is not... Web 5 was created by Jack Dorsey at Square, now called Block. He is a person who has a lot of money, who has invested in internet transaction systems, and has invested really heavily in Web 3. And his creation of Web 5, I would argue, cannot be for the users themselves but rather must be for his financial interests as someone who is heavily invested in Web3, and this was released in 2022 after all of the Web3 crashes occurred, and also someone who is heavily invested in payment transactions. I do not trust things that are created by the like billionaire class to talk about revolutionizing our day-to-day -day lives because all of capitalist history has like shown us that the people who have the power and the money will work to consolidate that power and money. That is just like the way that the process works. And the ways that we have worked against that are with um like communal action. I will phrase it that way because some people agree and disagree with governments and, and things like that. But in essence, it has only been, I think, throughout almost all of human history, where the average person has gotten an improvement in living conditions because they have worked together to fight against the existing systems of power. And someone in an existing system of power, aka Jack Dorsey, saying, hey, I've reinvented everything. You know how you're sick of all of these companies stealing your data? Well, instead, why don't you use my new system? And again, I don't know enough to be able to say whether or not Web5 specifically is good or bad, but I think it generally falls into the same trap that I see that Web3 hucksters fall into. Where again, Web3 as a specific technology to do specific things, I think sure, there's uses there. But the, the general idea of being someone who is going to create a system to fix things and also being a person who is lobbying against government regulate regu government regulation and antitrust and taxation on corporations and things like that if you have those interests i don't see how you can simultaneously have the interests of the end user in mind when jack dorsey i believe um Okay, an example here is Peter Thiel talked a lot about Web3, I believe. I'm like 99% sure that he was a, a big Web3 proponent. And he also owns or made Palantir, a company that sells government institutions and police institutions surveillance data um, and facial recognition and things like that. And I don't see how those two things can be meshed together. The idea of like decentralization, power to the users, and also I make my money by selling your data to the government. I'm gonna take a step back here. <laughs> but in essence, I think like I'm gonna link Yeah, late stage capitalism, y'all. Um
there are two different things here. So we're going to talk about first, I think it's important to talk about NFTs and cryptocurrency as financial assets. And I'm going to drop a link about that. And then we're going to talk about decentralization and Web3 concepts. I'm going to drop a link about that. These are two video essays done by Dan Olson of Folding Ideas, and they both have become very popular and are incredibly well researched and incredibly well produced. And I would argue that they are like, if you are interested in this and you want to hear from like a, a more articulate and well researched source than me, where some of my opinions are related to these two video essays. The line goes up, which talks about cryptocurrencies and NFTs and the ways that they are using that technology to take money from average consumers. And then specifically, um, we have the second one, which is Decentraland in the Metaverse, which is talking about the idea of decentralization and the metaverse and how that does something very similar. How these are systems that are used by existing systems of power that are claiming to give power back to people, but are actually just giving more power to these institutions. Um, I saw a documentary where it was explained how Metacoven, the guy who bought the $69 million NFT, the artist who made the NFT and a company working on the concept of the NFT were involved together and how they pushed the idea on a massive scale. Yeah, so Metacoven owned an existing blockchain and NFT system that was worth almost nothing. And then he bought the Beeple art as the first large scale NFT. And then the crypto boom that started because of his actions, he made hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and again, that is talked about in the video essays that I linked above, um, where the people who started the like crypto craze and bubble were people who were already invested in cryptocurrency. And there's this idea of that people made money in cryptocurrency, but you can't pay your rent using Bitcoin. You can't buy food using Bitcoin. You cannot survive based on Bitcoin. So if you get really, really rich on Bitcoin and you have so much money in Bitcoin, you can only actually use that money to survive if you get it out of Bitcoin. And that is a market that is an exchange where the price that Bitcoin sells for in, let's say, US dollars is based on whatever people are willing to buy Bitcoin for in US dollars. So this huge spike in popularity was trying to get the average person to <sighs> basically was trying to get the average person to buy in because without new US dollars coming in, the Bitcoin was worthless because you can't there is no inherent value to Bitcoin other than what people are willing to pay for it. So if you convince more people to pay for it, hey, you can sell it to them now and you can actually convert your money to Bitcoin or your, your Bitcoin to USD. Again, that's an oversimplification link to the video essays. It's like four hours of total stuff that is just like incredibly well researched. In essence, the reason why this bubble happened, in my opinion, was so that the whales could cash out um, and leave the average person holding the bag. Again, this is nothing about the like individual small tech companies that are like, hey, we're using Web3 to help you make a more efficient server architecture for your whatever. Um, Dimmer, the emulator that can go there and just about anywhere. Uh, gotta love Dimmer's streams. I'm glad you like it. Dimmer, the Lord of Tangents. Dimmer is basically a subway system at this point. Um, sad they're going away. Global Hack Week is ending. Like, I, I don't have, uh, I don't have control over that. And yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, someone asked a question earlier about Web3 that started this, but I highly, highly recommend watching those two video essays. Um, they're incredibly well researched, incredibly well produced. I have watched each of them like three or four times over at this point, um, because I felt for the first time like I was like hearing something that actually made sense to me, where I had seen all of this push, again, that was like adjacent to tech spaces. I don't think it was necessarily completely in tech spaces, but it was adjacent to tech spaces of people saying that this was the future, but not giving a reason why it was going to change things. Um, 
And this helped me understand some of the underlying reasons under that. With that, do we have anyone else with anything that we want to talk about? Dimmer, let's open a company. Uh, what would that company do? <laughs> the same question that I would ask a lot of these like people who are talking about their AI companies or their Web3 companies. Um, you're wanting to raise money, but what does that company do? You're wanting to raise hype. You want me to, to get involved, but what does it actually do? We will sell podcasts. So, ooh, okay, here's a cool thing. Podcasts and email are two truly decentralized systems. And they aren't based on Web3. They are Web1 concepts because that was where there was decentralization. You can, podcasts are an RSS feed. I don't need to ask Apple to put my podcast into their, their system. I can post an RSS feed of my audio files on the internet anywhere, and anyone can add that to their podcast app. And Apple collects those and adds them and, and does all of these things, but you can host a podcast without permission from anyone super easily. Email, you can run your own email server, and you can send email back and forth without needing to involve any companies super easily. It is truly decentralized because it is simple enough that it can work on an individual level. So selling podcasts as a subscription goes against what I love about podcasts so much, which are that anyone can make and host and release a podcast and anyone can download any podcast. Some really cool stuff there. So am I in? 50-50 um, split, but it is predicated on uh, a, a, a funding round of at least $10 million. Do we... We have a deal. We're going to go talk to some investors, get some seed funding. If we can raise at least $10 million, I'm in. It's mind-blowing that you have knowledge and unbiased real opinions about everything we ask. I want 70-40. I will do 70-40 because then we will love 110% of the company. Um, it's mind-blowing how you have knowledge and unbiased real opinions about everything we ask. I do not have unbiased opinions. I want to be very clear. My opinions are very biased based around my worldview and the way that I, I see the world. Um, but I have knowledge and opinions around most of this because I've spent a lot of time, like, let's do a 30, 40, 60 split between us three. I mean, let's do a 50, 50, 50 split. That way we all have half the company. That way I think that works better. Um, yeah, I like have this knowledge about these things because when like, I don't know, I've sat with them for a long time and because I like have been outside of a lot of these systems and not really understanding why. And also because there are a lot of really good people who make really great video essays about these topics and that are really informative that I then can reference later. Um, okay. Here's another amazing scam that I've never seen anyone talk about. It's my own observation from which I found it. The scam is called skincare routines. So fun fact, do you know when a lot of skincare routine videos started popping up? That was during the start of my the pandemic. So here's my observation and inference. I believe that skincare routines were funded greatly by makeup cosmetic companies because people don't really put on makeup if they are at home. So if someone comes up with this amazing idea of having skincare routines promoted during the pandemic and then it blows up. I mean... That's a little too tinfoil hat because I've never heard about anything like that. But also the cosmetic companies are like, they're all owned by the same companies. Like that does check out. Um, and yeah, those, those companies, like there are, there are whole things about whether or not soap and shampoo and those sort of things are scams and whether or not like our body would work differently and better without them. Um, I don't know a whole lot about, like I've heard people who have really good experiences with like never shampooing their hair again and it gets like really greasy for a bit and then it like evens out and then they're like my hair is great now and, and super luscious and all of these things um so there is there is definitely an argument there of like that i know that it was in essence it was at like the start of industrialization where the average person was able to bathe for the first time, 
I think us CS people are big proofs you don't need to shower a lot. I hard disagree. Hard disagree. I would love it. I would love it if, if like big tech companies and big computer science institutions like gave extra credit for showering. It would make my like experience in not all computer science spaces and not all compu computer science people, but some computer science spaces and some computer science people. Um, oh, but yeah, skincare stuff. I don't know. I have a skincare routine. I cleanse, exfoliate, moisturize. But in essence, I do it because it makes my skin feel nice and nothing else. Just because it is a thing that makes me feel nice about myself. Um, I don't think I would need to. I think I would be fine if I didn't do it. But generally, I think there's there's like a gradation here again of like there are people, there was the clean girl trend where it was showing like these hundreds of hundreds of dollars worth of products that they were cleanses and and tinctures and and moisturizers and all of these things um and i think there's a difference between that which like i would say might be a little bit too much and might be like a little too much for most people to to interact with and then on the other end there is like i don't know if soap works for your skin heck yeah do what works for your skin do what feels good for you i don't think there's any like solution here but for people who do have like different i don't know eczema or like oily skin or acne or these different things um different skincare sc stuff can make them feel better about themselves which i think has a really good purpose i think buying something that makes you feel better about yourself or makes you feel better is worth it anyway uh <laughs> okay you gotta go Thank you so much for stopping by. This was a really fun stream. I really like talking to y'all about the on-topic stuff for the first hour and a half and then just having this like fun little rant time with y'all for the last like 20 minutes. Um, I think actually we are going to end early, like around now, in order to give people time to like switch over to the next stream and make sure that I'm not running over because with switching to MLH Red, there's going to be more like technical difficulties for people setting up streams and for people attending streams. So we're going to end slightly early. Uh, I'm going to drop the links to the most important resources that we talked about. Again, chooseolicense.com for choosing an open source license that works for what you want to do with your project and the Creative Commons license chooser tool. These are the two tools that we can use to both understand more about licenses as they exist and choose a good one for you to use in your projects. Um, another amazing stream. Thanks, Dimmer and y'all. So glad you liked it. And I learned so much. Thank you so much, Dimmer. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed. I had tons of fun with the stream. And yeah, I'm going to be on tomorrow, 1 to 2 p.m. We're going to be playing uh, Telestrations or Gardic Phone in Discord. So stop by for that. There's going to be an announcement. Um, but that'll be fun. And then, yeah, that'll be the end of, of Global Hack Week Open Source. Uh, thank you so much, Dimmer. You're awesome. Learned a lot of things. I'm so glad y'all learned and enjoyed the stream. And with that, I'm going to say happy hacking. And I will see y'all tomorrow. Also, oh, wait, let's see what the next stream is. Oh, the next stream is today in Global Hack Week. So definitely stick around for that. Uh, it's going to be starting in like five-ish minutes. Um, and they'll be going over all the remaining streams that are happening today and probably tomorrow as well. I think. Don't quote me on that one. That one might be wrong. No, just the ones that are happening today, probably, because there's another today in Global Hack Week. Anyway, stick around uh, for that, and also take care of yourselves. Go eat. Do all of the things. <laughs> Happy hacking, y'all. Thanks for coming, and I'll see y'all. Bye.